Hey, before we get started today, I want to talk about some bad actors in our industry right now that are trying to sell fear. Uh, the annuity salesman is who I'm talking about. They're using fear of the past election, fear for market volatility, fear about losing money forever. And it's all uh, to sell you a product that pays them the most money. We have done the math on these annuities. They don't make sense, especially the index annuities. You need to stay away. I have a white paper we've created just for you. If you've been pitched to annuity or if you have an annuity, go to our website, wiserinvestor.com. Scroll down to the bottom. We have a buyer beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity white paper? Enter your email. You'll get emailed the white paper and you can learn more about this vicious process that these uh, bad actors are doing uh, in our industry. Stay away from them. Always look for a fee-only advisor, people working in your best interest at all times, fiduciaries. That's wiserinvestor.com. Scroll to the bottom. Subscribe to receive our white paper on why the annuity is a bad deal for you. Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom are my co-hosts, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, Brad. Hi, Casey. Matthews, welcome back. How's it going? Glad to be back. We it's missed been a you while. the last few weeks. Thank you. Uh, how was your two-week vacation? <laughs> uh, I've had better vacations, that's for sure, but uh, glad to be back. It wasn't the best. <laughs> uh, this topic... Uh, for this week is uh, dividend growth strategies, dead in this growth world. Brad, um, I have to say, I look at value investing. In value investing, uh, we typically think of dividend-paying stocks or companies that have been beat up and have better potential going forward, but mostly dividend stocks. Um, and I look at the last five years and I say, man, growth stocks are up a hundred and twenty-two percent over the last uh, five years, and the value stocks are up eighty-four uh, percent. That's a pretty big. That's a pretty big gap. Even on uh, the last year, we think about um, going through the COVID uh, sell-off. Uh, the S and P uh, a year ago today up seventeen percent. And value stocks are up four percent over the last twelve months. You know, I I like to say that um, I, I I like to think that value stocks aren't dead, or growth or dividend stocks are not dead. But um, this is not our grandparents' mar stock market, right? No, it's not. Things have changed relative to investor preferences that, versus just a few years back. It seems like um, the the dividend paying companies are really a somewhat of a hybrid of value companies. They're companies that exhibit the ability to manage their cash flows in such a way that they're able to meet a, an obligation that they have stated with their shareholders to share in their profits with them. Um, so it's it, they, they have a value tilt, but interestingly enough, the largest dividend-paying sector in the S&P 500 is information technology. So as those companies, which are traditionally thought of as growth companies, um, mature in the marketplace, uh, they have begun to pay dividends and they've become the largest paying sector, replacing past large um, sectors you know, of paying dividends, of traditionally thought of as utilities or energy or um, consumer staples or other defensive stocks. So it's not the market that we knew years ago. It's not our grandfather's market for sure. But in information technology, those are, are probably our grandparents' names, AT&T, IBM, right? Well, some of those are in there as well. But you know, even more recently in the past five years or so, some of the larger well-known uh, technology companies have begun paying dividends. Apple, for one, is a great example. Microsoft, for years and years and years, did not pay a dividend, now pays a dividend and increases it regularly. Companies like Intel, Cisco, um, Oracle, 
you know, across a broad band of technology of equipment makers, software producers, et cetera, are all paying dividends now. So when we think about dividend paying strategies, there, there are really two primary that, that stick out, right? Yes, there are. And they're, they're very unique in their, in their strategies as a company. Uh, there are what's referred to as your dividend growing companies. And then your companies that are payers. So you have the growers versus the payers. Growers are companies that, as it, it seems, companies that are growing their dividend year over year over year as their revenues and profits are growing. Payers are the ones paying out a large portion of their retained earnings. And they're thought of and viewed very differently in the marketplace and rewarded as such. So the whole concept behind uh, dividend growth is that you're taking the income that you're getting and you're going to reinvest that or you're going to live off of it. So the dividend yield of the S&P 500 right now is... It's around 1.5%. So 1.5, relatively... That's relatively low. It's historically low. We're also at all-time highs price-wise. That's right. And there's that inverse relationship between the two, just like on a bond yield. Right. So when we think about, uh, this is probably a, a good thing to note, that there's two type of returns for our, the major indexes that we track. There's price return, which is what you see on TV, mm-hmm. right? They tell you the price change. Right. Uh, and then there's uh, total return. And total return includes the payment of the dividend. Correct. So it's important to understand that you have the total return of a fund and then you have the price return of the fund. Right. So on prospectuses for a more actively managed fund, that's always total return. Uh, but when we look at indexes, oftentimes we'll, what was referenced is price return, not including the reinvestment of those dividends. And total return, which includes the reinvestment, brings into the, the, uh, uh, the investment process, considers compounding returns or compounding interest. So you're compounding that dividend year over year over year over year in terms of overall valuation and return of your investment. Now, over the past 10 years, the dividend growing companies as an index called the S&P High Yield Dividend Aristocrats, which is made up of companies that have grown their dividend consistently and consecutively for 20 years or more. The difference between the aggregate price return of the companies versus the aggregate total return of the companies is 46% higher for those that, when you consider their compounding of payment of dividends. 46% higher. That's correct. So 46% of the total return of the S&P high-yield dividend aristocrats came just from the dividend. So I have so many thoughts on that. <laughs> um, I guess the first thought is when you have a COVID sell-off, when you have a financial crisis, when you have anything that spooks the market and you have this massive decline, your price is declining. And we see that in our statements. But the entire time, there's this constant dividend that keeps getting paid out. Right? That's right. So if we sell out of fear... We not only are we realizing losses, we're now we're missing our payments. That's true. That's true. And the payment has the ability has the effect on the price of buffering it in down periods. So investors recognize that they're still going to get that dividend, all else being equal. And so the price decline historically for the dividend growers and dividend payers has been less than those of the growth companies that don't pay dividends at all right? during a downturn, a significant downturn. And we've seen a couple of these in the past eh, 15, 20 years. We saw the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008, 2009. And then again, this year, past year, with the COVID crisis. So we've seen these significant declines, and we can actually measure the non-paying companies, Versus the paying companies versus the growing companies for dividends. But I still have a thesis, and you might have the data to support this or refute this, but I'm, I'm still thinking over the last five, ten years 
that growth has far outpaced dividend strategies. Oh, it has. It has. It has a, for an investor, it has a different objective. For the investor that's looking for growth because they're in a station in life where they're trying to not only accumulate as much money as they can, but grow that money as fast as possible, a growth strategy has far outpaced a dividend strategy. Now, for a person who's in a different, another station in life where they are taking that accumulated value and they're looking for ways to receive payments from that, the dividend strategy has been an excellent source of income for several reasons. One of the primary reasons is that that dividend has actually increased, has actually outpaced inflation. And as we've seen interest rates come down over the years, and inflation has steadily risen, although not very much, but it steadily rises over the years, those interest payments from coupon clipping from bonds has gone down, whereas those dividend payments from dividend-growing companies has actually gone up year over year over year over year to help offset inflation. And that and that's interesting. But I guess from a portfolio modeling standpoint, why wouldn't I take the higher growth fund, shave off the, the gains, and move them back into less risky asset classes? So I'd have a growth tilt – knowing that once a year when I rebalance, I'm taking off those excess gains and I'm putting it back into the bond side of my portfolio versus having a a portfolio that is more tilted toward value and dividends without that growth component, right? Because I would have missed out on a tremendous rate of return over the last five to 10 years. Well, yes, on a, on a total compounding sense, that's true. But the person who's looking for the investor is looking for that um, that stream of income is also looking for the consistency of that stream of income, for the looking for the ability to actually project out their expenses over the years versus those income payments to them over the years as well. So it's a com- different style of investing. Both are legitimate. However, on the growth, you know. Um, style that that you had mentioned, you're still um, dependent upon (laughs) that those growth companies are still valued higher each year because somebody else is willing to pay up for them. So there's there's more risk, but over the past five, ten years, those investors have been paid well for that risk. On the dividend side, the dividends have grown. In fact, last year alone, those that companies that did increase their dividends increased it at a rate of over 8% when inflation was somewhere around 1.5, 1.6%. So you offset inflation with the increase in dividend, and you get whatever upside there is in equity valuations of those companies. It, it's, still, it's still hard to imagine having a value tilt uh, versus versus just an overall portfolio. I you know, and I've always had a hard time making the decision. Is this a growth year or is this a value year? Uh, for me and how I direct portfolios here and you as well, um, it, it's more of a core. We want to own both in our portfolios uh, going forward. Now we do have a little bit of a tilt currently toward uh, some technology through uh, uh, through a Vanguard uh, allocation. But um, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I see, uh, partially the dividend strategy, potentially if people, for people who want to take on more risk than bonds, that's probably where you might want to look you know, uh, right now versus a, a, you know, a 10-year treasury at, at, I think the last time I saw it was 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8% yield. Uh, that's just below inflation, right? Right. The, uh, the aggregate bond index is paying just under 2.5% versus the uh, – Aristocrat strategy paying two point two and three quarters percent plus any upside on the equity valuation. Right. Uh, so it's very difficult to get income from fixed income investments these days. Uh, and and as rates have come down, interest rates have come down. You don't see that appreciation in bond prices to the extent that you can see the appreciation in equity prices for those companies that pay dividends. So when, when rates had come down in the past several years, we've seen a very good run in valuations for dividend-paying companies. Over the past 
five years, the dividend aristocrat strategy has averaged over 11% annualized return. Well, right right now, I mean, the tide might be switching a little bit. If, if you look at – this isn't much data right now, but if you look at year-to-date returns, um, so that would be January 1 – uh, through uh, the 19th, so just you know, 19, 19 days into the year, uh, we're, we're already looking at some dividend strategies uh, with a 6% rate of return versus the market hovering around 1% uh, year to date. So we, we could see a tide starting to move back toward value after a decade of underperformance. We could, and I, you know, we could attribute probably a large part of this directly to interest rates as investors are looking for yield beyond the traditional yield producing sectors of or in investments such as fixed income banks certificates of deposits etc looking beyond that and willing to go out a little further on the risk spectrum they'll find these dividend paying companies and bid those prices up so it, it's uh you know obviously this that's a very short time span so we're i'm not going to call it a, a value year uh, certainly yet but um I think the advantages of doing a dividend strategy is lower volatility versus uh, the, the, the growth counterparts. You are getting consistent dividend. Uh, it's definitely slow and steady, um, but I, you know more importantly, it's it takes time because you, if you think about a dividend strategy, if, if I invest a thousand dollars into the S and P five hundred, I'm going to get what one hundred and fifty bucks. Right. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> right? Uh, 15. Or 50. That's right. Carry the zero. One more. 50, that's even worse. It's just math. It's 15 bucks. Yeah. That's 15 bucks. Right. So you're reinvesting $15 a year versus if you invest that in the uh, the high yield strategy. Right. You're reinvesting $27 a year. So, and then what's the, the, the beautiful thing about compounding in this environment is you're every quarter you're taking that dividend and you're buying more shares. And then those shares next quarter pays more shares, right? Which buys more shares, which pays more dividend, excuse me, I should have said, which buys more shares, which pays more dividends, which buys more shares, which pays more dividends. So the compounding growth effect on the dividend payers shows up in the total return over longer periods of time. I think it's important to note, too, you mentioned high-yield dividend payers. We're not talking about always look at the highest yielding because there's going to be companies out there that state they'll pay a certain dividend. Uh, They might not pay that high dividend and also could be a more speculative company as well. So we're not always, just like we say in fixed income, not to chase the high-yielding fixed income. It's it's also not finding the highest-yielding dividend because it may not be the most quality company. That is so true, Matthews. That is so true. When companies, you know, especially the highest of the high yielders are are paying out that dividend, they're often paying it out of retained earnings, which means they're not paying it out of revenue and profit. Okay, So they're paying it out of their retained earnings to try and attract and retain shareholders, to try and boost the the price of the shares, because they have other reasons for wanting to have a higher share price for their ability for, um, for bank loans, for securitization, for... Uh, any clauses or covenants that they may have in existing lending, you know, arrangements, and plus the management, if they have ownership in the company, you know, they want to boost their own stock price as well. So you have to be very carry, careful of those highest yielding companies. So if you have um, if you have a million dollars, you're basically getting twenty at, at a two percent yield. You're get, basically getting twenty thousand dollars a year. That doesn't seem like that much, but if you compound that, so the next year you take 20000 it buys more shares, and then 40, 60, 80, 90, 100, right? That's right. Plus the pi- price appreciation. Plus of the, the price stock appreciation. Of the and stock. the increase in the yield, hopefully, uh, through increased dividends over time, that is like a snowball it starts building and building and building. I think that obviously is the strategy behind it. It's not a get in, get out, you know. Buy, buy Amazon at this price and sell it at this price, then go back and buy it again at this price. It's it's really more of a it really is a long term a long term strategy inside the portfolio. It is it is and and dividend investors uh, probably inherently know that. 
Otherwise, they, they yeah. wouldn't be. They'd be very frustrated right now for the, <laughs> over the last 10 years. At least last year, they watched the S&P go up 17%, and they have a, a – it actually, actually was a negative half a percent rate of return, I think, for our value. Um, dividend is probably a little higher than that. But that was a price return, not a total return. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, it's not a Robin Hood uh, investing uh, strategy. <laughs> no, you're probably sure. not going to see this yeah, without that, a Robin Hood point. <laughs> that's a good point because the people who would benefit most from this would be millennials, but that's not what they're buying right now. They're 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 buying, um, you know, the Teslas, which you can't argue with that trade right now. Uh, you know, Apple and Amazon and uh, evidently Hertz in bankruptcy, which has baffled me. Um, <laughs> Jets, whole, ETFs, when all the uh, all the airlines were struggling. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's there's a play there. It's a very short term play, but there's a play there too. Uh, not our again, not our style. Um, I, I think uh, for most of our clients, um, you know, they they want to focus on maybe growth if you're younger. But uh, our older established clients are. It, it's more of why would you risk? Why would you risk more to get more if you're comfortable with your lifestyle now? Uh, I have that conversation a lot. Is yeah, you can try to double this, but why? Why would you do that? Why would you take on risk to where if if you lost it, even just for a couple of years, you have high anxiety, you have, um, you, you know, worry about paying even your bills, right? You never want to be in that position. So you want to have a rate of return higher than inflation. But if, if you're comfortable maintaining your current lifestyle, there's no reason to take that additional risk. No, it's all about so. setting your portfolio to meet the objective that you've set forth for yourself for the portfolio. And then not taking on any more risks than necessary. And dividend investing is a way to offset those risks, those risks of income, you know, an income replacement from earned income in the past. So, well, I, I think to a certain generation, uh, dividend investing is, is dead. I'll say it. I, I think to um, a 20 year old, um, a 30 year old, uh, I, I don't know that that's on their mind. Because in our, our news cycle does not promote long-term investing, right? It's just a different a- attitude and behaviors, I think, just the yeah. way you look at it. Yeah. We, we, have, we have shows on CNBC uh, during and after the market close that don't promote long-term investing. They promote uh, almost day trading, but monthly trading, <laughs> 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 right? No one ever talks about long-term investing. The only time I ever hear people talk about long-term investing is when the market gets way, way down. Um, and then you'll see some of the talking heads talk about it. I mean, we even have uh, RIAs on on CNBC now that talk about individual stocks, and they don't even own individual stocks in their own client portfolios, which is proof to me that it's this is all entertainment that, that we watch on TV. It's it's not actual investing. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I you know the it's, it's all going to catch up eventually. It all will even out. Value stocks will not be underperforming. For another 10 years. No, I don't not think. forever. No. It, it will cycle back around. Mm-hmm. There's lots of research that promotes that. Um, but anyway, I just thought it'd be a fun topic today to talk about um, a strategy that we never hear about in the news anymore. No, we don't. But uh, I'll assure you this. Nobody's ever sent a dividend check back in the mail. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's it, too. You, you don't get the checks in the mail. Remember, we used to own stocks that? who drip programs. Yeah. You literally get a check in the mail. Or you get a receipt that your dividend was reinvested into the company. Uh, but no one really no one really sees that. We actually show that on our quarterly uh, reports, though. We show in, we have income. A, yeah, we have an income mm-hmm. statement that says this is how much income all your investments paid out over the last three months. And one time we forgot to attach it, and people called up and said, well, hey, I didn't get that income report. So I know people look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves income. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, good conversation, guys. And we'll see you next time. Okay. See ya. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.